let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer as we begin to uh, spend some time in His Word this morning. Lord, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for this passage in uh, James' letter. I pray that You will use it to teach us who it is that You've called us to be. Help us to rely on the wisdom from above as we follow You. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, I I don't watch a whole lot of movies, but I really enjoy movies. Um, I don't really enjoy very many that have come out in the last number of years. I mean, um, and it saddens me a little bit to think about some of the movies that are now being referred to as classics, right? Because um, I was like mostly grown or grown when they came out. How can it possibly be a classic, right? It's still practically new. Um, arguably, one of the greatest movie franchises in the history of movies, right? One of the greatest series of movies um, is the Indiana Jones series of movies. I, I really enjoy Indiana Jones, right? And so, um, uh, yeah. It, the, the adventure, right? The fun, the, the the drama, but it's not so heavy, right? There's still a little humor in there. I mean, it's they're generally really clean. I mean, it's you know, and, and even though the fourth movie in the Indiana Jones series of movies, I, if you've not seen it, don't don't go back and watch that one. Pretend it never existed. That's the one about the crystal skull, the one that never should have been made. Um, even with that terrible, terrible movie among the series, it's still one of the best series of movies ever produced. I really believe that. I think it's better than Star Wars. I think it's better than, like, The Lord of the Rings. I think it's better than just most all of them, right? It's, uh, it's good stuff. But one of my favorites of the series is 1989. It's the third one in the series. Uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Now, there's a number of things that make this movie great. Not the least of which is Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones, right? I mean, nobody can play Indiana Jones but Harrison Ford. I, I really believe that. Um, but what else makes this movie great is his father is in the movie, Henry Jones, and he's played by Sean Connery. And I'm, come on, Sean Connery, right? He's, he is, he's great, and he's a lot of fun to watch. The basic storyline of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade is that um, the Nazis are chasing... Uh, they're searching for the Holy Grail. Now, the Holy Grail is allegedly, it's supposedly the cup that Jesus drank from at the Last Supper. And then the, the great legend, and this is actual religious legend mostly in the, in the, in the Roman church. Uh, the great legend is that you got this, this chalice that Jesus drank from at the Last Supper that John then took and at the cross... He caught some of Jesus' blood in the chalice, right? And so this this made this holy chalice, right? It's the holy grail, and um, and that whoever drinks from the chalice would then have eternal life, right? We know that's not where eternal life comes from, but let's lay that aside for a moment because it's a great movie. Um, and so Indiana Jones and his father are trying to uh, find the Holy Grail before the Nazis do and prevent this great power from falling into their hands. Now, there's a lot more to it than this, but that's sort of the sort of the, the basics of it, right? And so they, toward the end of the movie, um, they, they um, follow all these clues. They find the place where the cup is hidden. It's in this chamber in this ancient structure, cave kind of deal, right? And so it's in there, and they find their way into this hidden place, <coughs> and there's torches, there's fire around. I don't know what the fuel is, right? It's the magic of Hollywood. And I don't know how it's not a thousand degrees in there because it's being heated by fire. And there's this old knight who is guarding it. He's hundreds of years old. He has been tasked with guarding the grail. And, and there's, on this ledge, all of these cups, all of these chalices, right? There's dozens of them. And that's, those were the two measures of security, right? This this old, frail, feeble knight, and the fact that there are dozens of, of these chalices, dozens of these cups, and you don't know which one it is. And so, Indiana Jones, uh, he, he finds it, and then the Nazis follow right in on him, and um, the bad guy is holding Indiana Jones at gunpoint, 
he insists on choosing which cup first, right? Because he's going to win. And the old knight tells him, this is a great, it's a great line. It's where it all hinges. The, the old knight says, you must choose, but choose wisely. Whereas the true grail will bring you life, the false grail will take it from you. And so the Nazi, the bad guy, he's got this woman with him. She says, ah, let me choose. And she scans over real quick and she grabs this, this, this chalice and it's shiny, polished gold and these jewels on it and she hands it to the man and he looks at it and it's like he's glowing, right? He just knows this is, he dips it in the water and he says, now this is a cup fit for the king of kings and he drinks from it he smiles and then immediately he dies. Now there's no more to his death. I was going to show the clip but at his death I didn't want to show that up here. And so it's on YouTube if you want to go find it. It's, you know, it's a lot of fun. Um, he didn't get eternal life. He died on the spot. After he dies, the old knight looks at Indy and he says in the most calm voice he chose Poorly. He didn't choose wisely. He chose poorly. And then Indy reaches into the group of chalices and he picks up this basic, simple cup. And then he remarks, this is the cup of a carpenter. He drinks from it and it doesn't kill him. And the knight says, you have chosen wisely. And he was able to take this to his father. His father had been shot. He was able to, his wounds healed immediately. And the whole, the the rest of the story goes on. But this was the result of Indiana Jones' wisdom in making the choice. Now, let's think about you and me for just a minute, right, in wisdom. Have you ever, like, can you look back over your life and think of a time where you chose poorly? He chose poorly. In, in, in fact, it, you, you can, if one comes to mind, it's not going to shame, I don't want to shame anybody. But if you'd like to tell a, a little story on yourself of a time you chose poorly, uh, we'd love to hear that, right? You, you guys look like you might want to tell something. So, no? It's probably they don't want to tell something. <laughs> probably they don't want to tell something. Does anybody, I'm not going to make anybody, I won't belabor this, but anybody wants to tell a little story on themselves of a time they chose poorly? This is those times, you know, where you look back and you say, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I did something so stupid. I cannot believe I made that decision. I can't believe that I did that kind of damage. I can't believe how I hurt myself or how I hurt others. I really messed that up. I really made a bad decision. That's, that's the wisdom of this world. That's choosing poorly. On the other side... We have times in our lives where we choose wisely, right? Where, where we say, that I, I don't really know where I got the wisdom to make that decision. I don't know how I understood that, but I'm so glad I did. Does anybody want to tell a time where maybe you chose why? Brag on yourself a little bit and I don't get you know, conceited or don't get too, you know. But if, but if you'd like to tell a time where you chose wisely, I, I would love to hear that as well. This is the most humble group of people on the planet. <laughs> These are those times where, you know, I'm so glad I did that. I'm so glad I was able to see that. I'm so glad I was able to say that. It was the right thing in the right moment. I'm glad it was a decision made well. We're gonna um, we're gonna get to James three in just a second, but uh, go and put that chart up, Jacob. Um, the Sunday that we looked at, and you've, you've seen this before, twice, um, on two different Sundays. The Sunday we looked at James 1, 26 and 27, we talked about the three marks of a child of God, right? And this was uh, a controlled tongue, uh, a ministry of caring, and living a holy life. And these were reflective of when we looked just a couple of weeks earlier at James 1, 18, these three characteristics of God the Father. And then... Um, we said that how, how James is going to use that kind of as a template to flesh those out over the rest of the book of James. And this is kind of what's happened. Chapter 2, 
was about this ministry of caring, right? not showing favoritism, caring for people, showing love to people. Uh, the first half of James 3 has been about a controlled tongue. And now we're entering the second half of chapter 3, and he starts to make this transition where he's going to be teaching us about a life of holiness. And the life of holiness starts with acting and with speaking with wisdom that God gives us. We're going to read from James chapter 3, beginning in verse 13, as we start this last section of the book of James, this last sort of extended portion. And um, he's going to start today by talking about how to live out wisdom. James writes this in James chapter 3, beginning verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? So he starts with this rhetorical question. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom, and I love that it's in quotes, right? <laughs> Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven, so he's talking about one kind of wisdom, now he's talking about the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Now we're not going to take the time today to really take this apart in great detail. There, there's a lot in here. and We could probably spend two or three weeks on this if we, if we wanted to. We're just going to do this today and go through it. Um, but it, on your bulletin in the Digging Deeper questions, it asks about some of these uh, digging a little deeper into some of these ideas. And I would encourage you to think through those and process through that and search the scripture for those answers. As we've read through the book of James, as we've studied the book of James, one thing I've noticed that's really stood out to me is um, that James' language, right, his choice of words, his language is so straightforward, is so to the point. Like, there are other writers in the New Testament. Like, if Paul had written the book of James, it would probably be like 12 chapters instead of 5, right? Because he would, he would say what he says, and then he would explain it all and spend some more time saying it. And James just, man, he cuts, he cuts right to the point. He's incredibly straightforward. His paragraphs are crystal clear. They're logical. They're easy to follow. And I think in this text today, he's going to answer three questions about wisdom. And I'll go ahead and tell you what the questions are, and you'll see them again uh, on the screen. But these questions I think he's going to answer about wisdom are, are this. At the start of it, he's going to answer, how can you recognize a wise person? And then, and then a little later, he's going to answer this. He's going to answer what happens when wisdom is missing from a person's life. These are important things. And then he's going to wrap up by answering what characterizes a wise person. And so he starts with this rhetorical question, who is wise and understanding among you? He, he wants us to be able to recognize how to recognize a wise person. The, this letter was written to be read, remember, uh, from early in the book. It was written to be read in churches, right? This was to the, to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. And so you've got Jewish uh, believers who are scattered all around outside Jerusalem. And he's written this letter to help them. And it's meant to be read in their churches. And... Um, when he asks this question, he's making a pretty blunt implication. Now think about this for a second. Let's say this isn't written in Scripture, but I just come and ask you, who, who among us is wise and has understanding? There's the implication there that some of us are wise and others are not, right? Right? He kind of helps them see that some of you are acting more wisely than others. Who among you is wise? <coughs> Who is wise and understanding among you? <coughs> How do you tell one from the other? How do you tell who's wise and has understanding? How, 
How, what do you think? How can you tell, and, and I won't point anybody out in this room, but just in general, how can you tell who is wise and has understanding? How do you recognize that in somebody? Because they're white, they don't talk much. Ouch! <laughs> in case you didn't hear that directed comment, no, I'm, I'm teasing you. I, I'm totally teasing you. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm going to assume that wasn't direct. Uh, a directed comment. It, it, the person is quiet. They don't necessarily talk a lot. I. I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. What I. What I hear you getting at is that this is a person who lives it out. Like it's actions. It's not just words, right? <laughs> and what do you, What do you think? How How can you tell somebody who's a wise person? Right? You know, in a, in a church context, in a spiritual context, right? How can you tell the difference? If some people exhibit more wisdom than others and more understanding than others, how can we tell the difference? They make right decisions. They make good decisions, right? They make right decisions. Yeah. And And in fairness, we often don't know in the moment that it was a right decision. You know what I mean? Like sometimes it takes a bit of time before we ever see um, the wisdom in that, right? We just, so if somebody has a history of showing wisdom, we tend to trust them even when we don't understand what the, even if we don't see the answer immediately, right? Like they've always made good decisions for us in the past. I don't know how this is going to work out like they think it is, but we're going to trust them because they've shown wisdom. Yeah, those are great ways. Um, those are great ways to, to tell uh, the difference, uh, to, to recognize somebody who's a wise person. I, I think it's an important question. James goes on to answer it for us. He says, let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. In other words, he'll show it by his actions. By, he'll have a history of wisdom. He, he lives a good life. Now, uh, we hear this expression, good life. I want to park here for just a moment, right? Um, here in America, that, that expression, what, when you hear somebody's got the good life, what do we think? Successful, rich, yeah. Right, they're living the good life. What was that? They're living the good life, right? They're living the... Living the dream, right? That's the good life. In fact, we've turned this expression into some kind of a vague, uh, in fact, it's almost a meaningless term for the kind of life that people would want to live, right? It's this nebulous kind of, I don't know what it is, but I'll know when I'm living it, you know? But I think James teaches us that only the Christian can truly, really live the good life. If it's a, that's a, a uniquely Christian opportunity. That doesn't mean only Christians can live a wealthy life or only Christians can live a, 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 a seemingly blessed life. But in terms of real quality, eternal value, only a believer can truly live a good life. And here's the sad part. is I don't think every Christian does. Certainly not everyone who professes to be a Christian lives the good life James describes. James uh, uses this expression um, to talk about our daily conduct. It takes wisdom to live this good life. To, to live day by day. To have a, a good life lifestyle. To have that kind of an ongoing demeanor. Wisdom shows up in our lifestyle. If you read on, I think you'll see James is talking about who is wise and understanding among you. Let him show it by his good life, by his deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. So if you look around and you say, man, my life sure could be better, right? I, I wish I lived a good life. It might be time to revisit this idea of your deeds being done in wisdom. Pursue the wisdom from above that we're going to hear more about in a minute. And let that inform how you live your life. These deeds done in wisdom. Humility 
deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Humility, I think, is the most elusive of all of our virtues. And the reason I think that is, is the moment you recognize that you have humility, it's gone. <laughs> wow, that was really humble of me. Oh, wow. I, that was unfortunate. There's a great example of this in the book of Acts. This idea of, um, the, uh, of the deeds done in humility from wisdom. In Acts chapter 9, uh, the last part, there's a story of a lady named Dorcas. <coughs> Tabitha, her Greek name was Dorcas. Here's what, here's what Luke writes in the book of Acts. He says, in Joppa, city of Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. And turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. And she opened her eyes. And seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand. He helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. I think this lady, Tabitha or Dorcas, I think she's a, one of the most um, interesting and maybe even a sort of appealing characters in all of Scripture. Because her actions, her testimony, her good life, her lifestyle, was exactly what James um, wrote about when he talked about wisdom. Somebody who humbly does deeds for others. Somebody who's a servant. Somebody who's an encourager, manages their life so well that they are a blessing, not just to their own life or their own family or even their church, but to the world around them. And so after James tells us how to recognize a wise person, he tells us what happens when wisdom is missing from a person's life. You could say, you say it like this. First he wrote about the embodiment of wisdom. Now he writes about the opposite of wisdom. And he answers the question, what happens when wisdom is missing from a person's life? Down in verses 14, 15, and 16 of, of James 3, here's what he writes. Uh, we read it a minute ago. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. In other words, don't lie to yourself, right? It, you've got it. You've got this selfish ambition, right? You've got this, this bitter envy. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Now, it may be that James was writing about, or he was concerned about conflict um, in the churches that, that this letter was going out to. Uh, we know he was at some level concerned about conflict in these churches. Now remember, when, when James wrote this, he wrote a letter. You've written a letter before, right? Now, even if you write a long letter, you don't put chapter divisions in it, right? These chapter and verse divisions were not part of the original letter that James wrote. This is translators added that long after the fact to help us break it down into readable chunks that were easy to grasp and hang on to and, and reference to find again. When James wrote it, he wrote it like you write a letter. And in the next paragraph down here a little bit, um, he's going to reference this idea of conflict. He, at the verse, first verse of chapter 4, he says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from, our desi from your desires that battle within you? That's selfish ambition. That's envy and selfish ambition. The desires, your desires that battle within you. Now, we're not going to talk about that today, that verse today. That's next week, Lord willing. Um, 
But James is addressing this idea of conflict being, being self-centered and motivated, right? I promise you, if you're in conflict with somebody, there's selfishness involved on at least one of your parts. And probably both at some level. Because even if you're attacked by somebody who's being selfish, it's your own envy and selfish ambition that makes you get highly defensive. Not appropriately defensive, highly defensive. And want to really fight. We think about envy and jealousy more or less as synonyms, but they're pretty different actually. Um, jealousy is the fear of losing something you have to somebody else. Does that make sense? So, so if, I, if, if I am afraid of losing my wife to somebody else, I am jealous. In fact, it, it, the Bible refers to God as a jealous God. In other words, He's jealous for us. There's, there is a, a sense that we could be lost to someone else, and He is jealous of that. He wants to maintain us as His own. Now that's a healthy, appropriate jealousy because God is God and we are His. We actually are His. But jealousy as a general rule is not always quite that healthy. The difference with that in envy, envy is when you see what somebody else has and you feel frustrated because of that. This is how Aristotle defined envy. Envy. He defined envy as the pain caused by the good fortune of another. That hurts a little because I often see that in me. It's easy to be envious of somebody else. It's easy to get frustrated because somebody else has, has possession of this thing or has accomplished this thing or has achieved this thing and here I am. Have you ever felt that way? Like, have you, have you ever felt that way? Like, man, and even like good things, right? It's not, maybe the worst is good things. When somebody that you know, love, respect has gained or accomplished or achieved something that you feel like you should have too. I'm as good as they are. I work as hard as they do. I love Jesus as much as they do. Like, what, what's going on? That's envy. That's all it is. It's, it's the pain caused by the good fortune of another. <clears throat> we all battle this. James gives us what I think is a, a, a three-point corrective to envy. First, recognize that it's a sin. Don't deny it. That he, he, he said, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition, don't boast about it or deny the truth. There's a, uh, there was a Christian composer, his name was John W. Peterson. Um, if you've ever sung a Christmas or an Easter cantata, there's a good chance you've seen his name, right? You may not remember it. He, over the course of his musical career, he wrote 35 cantatas. Now that doesn't sound all that spectacular. Remember a cantata has, I don't know, 15, 20 songs in it. He wrote over a thousand Christian songs. A prolific writer. But at one point in his career, he noticed that other composers and other Christian songwriters were becoming well-known and experiencing success, and it would frustrate him when their music became more popular than his own. He, he started out wanting to be that way. Nobody says, I want to feel that way. But he had this insecurity and this frustrated feeling. When he finally recognized it and he identified that his feelings were envy and his feelings were jealousy, he was able to confess it for what it was. It was wisdom from below that needed to be replaced with wisdom from above. James warns us not to deny the truth about, when, about envy and about selfish ambition. Be honest and confess it. Second, recognize the source of it. It is from the devil, right? I mean, it really is. It's evil. Verse 15, such wisdom does not come from heaven, but it is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Pretty straightforward, right? I mean, I, I've said this before, right? I'm not the. I believe in angels and demons. Don't, don't be confused about that. That being said, I'm not the guy who there's an angel or a demon behind every bush, right? Every, every sometimes things just happen. I, I believe that, you know. But James says that the source 
of that kind of thinking and that kind of attitude that it is earthly, it's unspiritual, and it's demonic. That's pretty serious. That's the source of the envy that we feel. And then third, recognize its destructive nature. So recognize that it is sin, recognize its source, and recognize the destructive nature of the envy. There's supposed to be a slide that says that, and apparently it's not there. Verse 16 says this, where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. I, I really have become convinced that if we could trace back to its very root every problem in our homes and in our churches, we would probably find at the root some kind of selfishness that exhibits itself as envy and selfish ambition. Right? We want what we want, and we want it when we want it, and we want it the way we want it. We, we want it, we don't want anybody else to have it. The wisdom that comes from below is what James warns us against. Now he's going to move to telling us about the wisdom from above. Verses 17 and 18, he gives us the qualities or characteristics of true godly wisdom. What characterizes a wise person? He, he says in verses uh, 17 and 18, the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a, reap a harvest of righteousness. I mean, literally, the verse says the wisdom that is coming down from above. That this, this is a wisdom that's coming down from above. It's, think of it like a stream, like a spring, right? You can have drought, but a spring typically will still flow because it comes from so deep below. It's a constant flow. James, back in chapter 1, told us that we could access this stream of wisdom in prayer. He said, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask of God. Then in verse 17 of chapter 1, he he wrote about every good and perfect gift. Where does it come from? It comes from above. This is the kind of wisdom that he calls on us to live out. This good life. And he describes it. He, he describes it well, just quickly. This wisdom is pure. It's not a polluted stream. It's, it's pure. It's mentally pure. It's, it's morally pure. It's a pure stream. It's peace-loving. It doesn't lead to conflict. Its relationships are harmonious. It's a, it is a wisdom that is considerate. I, I saw um, an old letter to, the, to a news, one of these newspaper advice columnist type letters um, where a young woman wrote in and said, I'm 19, I'm dating a guy who's 23, we've been dating about six months. I care for this man, but there are times when his behavior bothers me. One minute he is sweet, kind, and considerate. Then something triggers him and he threatens me. He uses bad language towards me and calls me an idiot. It's almost like he has a split personality. This is a young man that's not demonstrating wisdom from above. Neither is she to remain in this dating relationship with him, right? That's wisdom from below. Wisdom from above doesn't treat people the way he's treating her. That's wisdom from below. Wisdom from above is peace-loving. It's considerate. It's kind and it's gentle. Wisdom from above is submissive, James writes. It puts the needs of others first. It's full of mercy and good fruit. We read about Dorcas in, in uh, Acts. It's, it's like that. It's helping others and finding ways to go about... Um, performing acts of kindness for people, acts of love for people. The wisdom from above is impartial, James says. It's chapter 2 about, um, uh, about uh, prejudice and about discrimination, right? The wisdom from above doesn't do that. It's impartial. Wisdom from above is sincere. It's not an act. It's not a put on. It's the real thing. And it leads to peacefulness. I read a story this week. I stumbled over it. Um, it's an older story, probably 
eight, nine, ten years old, several years ago. The story uh, was on public radio, NPR, and it was about a man named Julio Diaz, who lives in New York City. At the time, he was a 31-year-old social worker, and he had this established daily routine. He had an hour-long commute each evening, uh, going home from work on the subway, and he would get off one exit early to stop by his favorite diner for supper. This is every day, this is his routine. And then he would walk on home. And one night, he stepped off the number six train, and the platform was empty. And as he was walking toward the stairs, a, a teenage boy approached him and drew a knife. And Julio calmly took out his billfold, he handed it to the boy, said, here you go. And as the boy walked away, Julio did something very unexpected. He said, hey, wait a minute. You forgot something. If you're going to be robbing people the rest of the night, you might as well take my coat to keep you warm. The boy turned and, what's going on here? Why are you doing this? Something inside Julio told him that this young boy needed help and wanted help. That there was something about him that wanted that wanted to be helped and Julio wanted to help him. So Julio said, if you're going to risk your freedom for a few dollars, I guess you probably really need the money. I mean, all I wanted to do is get dinner. If you want to join me, you're more than welcome. And so they walked to the diner together. They sat in a booth. The manager came over. Hey, Julio. Uh, the waiters came by and greeted him. The dishwashers, everybody came by and greeted Julio. Remember, he eats here every night. The boy asked him, he said, you, you know everybody here. Do you own this place? He said, no, I just eat here a lot. You're even nice to the dishwasher. And Julio said, well, haven't you been taught you should be nice to everybody? Yes, I didn't think people actually behaved that way. And Julio asked the boy what he wanted out of life, and he, he couldn't tell him. He just, he just had a sad face. The two of them ate together, and when the bill came, Julio told him, look, uh, you're going to have to pay the bill. You have my money, and I can't pay for it. If you'll give me my wallet back, I'll treat you. The boy reached into his pocket. He handed Julio his billfold. Julio paid the bill, and he gave the boy $20. And then he asked for something else. He asked for the young man's knife, and he gave it to him. And later, Julio said, I figure, you know, if you treat people right, you can only hope they treat you right. It's as simple as it gets in this complicated world. Now, this is NPR. They're not going to mention anything about Julio's uh, spiritual condition. Is he a believer? Is he not a believer? I can't answer that. He certainly behaved with the generosity a believer should behave. But I couldn't help thinking about um, in Jesus' uh, Sermon on the Mount when he, you know, somebody compels you to go a mile, go to him, right? They ask for your by giving them your cloak too, right? It, it just it, that made me kind of laugh when I read that in the story that he called him back and gave him his coat. Now this isn't the way, obviously, it's not the way we react every time somebody pulls a knife on you, right? I don't want you to be foolish. But the young man Julio had the wisdom to know how to react in that particular moment and it's an example of somebody who demonstrates wisdom from above. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, spiritual, demonic. Where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peace lovers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. Will you bow your heads with me? We're going to pray here in a moment and then sing another song for two or three. Um, but as we pray, here's what I want to pray for you. We all face times 
and situations in our lives and decisions that have to be made that we have to show wisdom. We don't need a natural wisdom of this world. We don't need a wisdom that is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. We need a wisdom from above. I want to pray for you that as you face those situations, as you face those decisions, that you will exhibit that kind of wisdom. And if the Lord has spoken to you about this, maybe there's something you know you're going to be facing soon, this week, this month, and you'd like to pray about that, that God would give you wisdom. I'd love to pray with you about that. At the very least, would you make a note of it on a card and put it in a box so that I can pray for you. Father, thank you that you give us wisdom from above. That you call us to make decisions through the power of your Spirit. Help us to not live in the wisdom of this world that is earthly and unspiritual and demonic, but Lord, to live in the wisdom from above. Help us, Lord, to be peacemakers who sow in peace. That there wouldn't be bitter envy and selfish ambition among us. That there wouldn't be discord and disunity. And Lord, as we close this time in our service and prepare to sing, if there's anybody that's facing a situation, they know they're going to need wisdom from you. So I pray that they would seek it out from you. That they would maybe even take some time to pray today for wisdom from above. Thank you that you promised to provide it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.